How's everybody doing? Good morning. Good morning, good morning. If you want to stand up with us this morning as we begin worship. In Psalms it says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Amen. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let all creation worship our mighty God. Are y'all ready to worship this morning? Come on, give a shout of praise. Y'all ready to worship this morning? Hallelujah. Let's lift up a shout. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's get our hands together this morning. Come on. I will dance out in faith. 
giants will still be here today. God, we believe. Yes, we can see it. The wonders are still what you do. We are here for you. Come and do what you do. We are here. Good morning. You may be seated if you can. Wow. Aren't you happy to be here this morning? Aren't you glad to be in church this morning? Well, I tell you, we have had a crazy, awesome weekend so far. Our youth has been celebrating D-Now Friday night all day yesterday, and they're here this morning, and we're not done. We don't end till this afternoon. And so amen for everything that is going on in the lives of our young people, our young minds, our teenagers, our, our children. Man, it's a great time. 
So we want to take a moment and welcome our guests. If we do have any guests here this morning, there's a welcome card in the seat right in front of you. If you'd grab that, fill that information out so we can get to know you. And at the end of service, we will have a gift that we would like to put in your hands. And likewise, if we have any guests watching online, if you go to bfchurch.com, click on the guest tab, fill out that information, and we will be looking for the day that you come join us in person because that is the goal is for you to worship with us in person. And so this morning, uh, we want to welcome each other. And so what I'm asking us to do is if we have any guests here, stay in your seats. Our youth who are celebrating D now this week, stay in your seats. Members, regular attenders, let's get up. Let's find someone who is sitting and let's welcome them to church this morning. All right, if everybody will return to their chairs, remain standing as we go to the Lord and his word. We have Aiden this morning reading the word from Psalm 55. Psalm 55, 12 through 14. It is not an enemy who taunts me. I could bear that. It is not my foes who so arrogantly insult me. I could have hidden from them. Instead, it is you, my equal, my companion and close friend. What good fellowship we once enjoyed as we walked together to the house of God. I just wanted to, I wanted to pray about uh, three things for the service, obviously, first and foremost, and for the men's event that's coming, the most important thing for us to realize is the home. This world is trying to break that, so in order to solidify it, is to get to the men to drop down on their knees and just worship God. 
uh, be mature. There's a lot of grown boys out in this world that we, we need real men out here. So um, and the only way to do that is to go through God. So we could pray for that as well. And then also for the Cuba conference, pray for the men, the women, everyone involved in it, that God does what he does. God does what he does. And the only way we could do that is by us moving. So let's, let's put it into action, you know, so we could just pray for that. Uh, Lord Jesus Christ, thank you so much for the God that you are, Lord God, that you move. And the only way that you move is through us, Lord God, so let us move too. We pray for the men's conference, that everything goes well according to your plan, Lord Jesus Christ, your sovereign. Let these men move, let these men come to this place together and gather and worship you, Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for the conference in Cuba that everything or anything they do is for your glory, Lord God. Open up their hearts, that they receive you, that they know they're, they don't stay incomplete, that they are complete in you, Lord God. And also for this service, let our hearts be open, let our ears be open and attentive. Let us all die together on the cross, Lord Jesus Christ, and, and rise with your words, rise with you, Lord God. You give us life. I pray that the words that come out of Pastor Gary's mouth, Lord, is your words, Lord. Let us listen to you this morning and just drop down our knees in our worship. In your name we pray, Lord God, amen.
Savior of the world. All hail Jesus, the King of kings. He is Lord. Lift up your shout. Let us join with all of heaven singing. Oh, 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 Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. He's been my fourth man in the fire, time after time. Born of his spirit and washed in his. Trusting God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. I trust in God, 
Amen, amen. You may be seated. Amen. Amen, amen. Thank y'all so much. 
thank you, thank you. Aren't they such a blessing? Amen, amen, amen. Ronnie and Haley, thank you so much again for coming out and, being, and joining us. And for the, the guys back here in the band, uh, let's just give them a round of applause. Amen. Thank you so much for just leading us in worship this morning. Y'all can go ahead and, 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 and go down. Thank you. I walk around a lot, Miss Haley. I'm going to have to move some of these things. So bear with us. It'll be on those uh, TikTok videos of pastors falling. All right. So we're in chapter five. All right, by show of hands, who read chapter five this week? All right, we don't even have a quorum. We don't even have a quorum of a quorum. We got four people. All right, so next week, what are we reading? Chapter six. There we go. Let me move these over here. So in the five, in the four previous chapters, right, we, Nehemiah has dealt with a lot of different challenges. He's, we got the challenge of the personal challenge, that burden that he carried, right? And then there was the political challenge to have to ask the king for permission, papers, materials, time off to go. And then there was unifying the workers. He had to get a whole bunch of people together and unify them to build the wall. And then there was discouragement, both external and internal discouragement, right? We talked about that last week. Because they were afraid of being attacked while they worked. And so what did they do? They divided the workload. Half of them worked, and the other half what? Slept. Not slept. The other half protected, right? The other half protected. So half protected, half worked. I do want to take a moment. I want to take a moment and... and, and I want to take a moment, and we do need to lift up what happened at Lakewood last week. We need to pray for that church. We need to pray for those that were involved. It is my prayer that nothing like that ever steps foot onto, to, into our church. That is my prayer. But know that we have a safety team. They have been tasked to protect us. And I praise God for them. I pray that they, they never have to do what they've stepped up to do, but you know, they're out there every they're out there every Sunday and they're monitoring the foyer, the children's area, the parking lot, even this sanctuary. And so I praise God for y'all. That's their job to keep us safe. Our job. It's to get down. Just get down. Because there's a tendency to want to look up. What's going on? And if you carry, know that if you carry and get up, all they see is a combatant. That's all they see. They don't see face. They see weapon. So our job, get down. Their job, Protect us. Because I know people want, there's a tendency to want to go get your kids. I was in the school district. I get it. We got, we went on lockdown. All lockdown, lockdown did was bring moss to the flame. Because here are the parents. I want my kid. We're on lockdown. Why can't I get my kid? Because we're on lockdown. So the nursery worker will take care of the nursery. The children's people will take care of the children. The safety team will take care of the safety team. Our job, get down. That's it. And so... With that being said, again, our prayer is first for Lakewood and those involved, and that, that, that evil never crosses into this, goes through the, the, the doors of this church. In the coming weeks, our safety team will be meeting and, and, and creating new guidelines and, and things, because it, it, it always has to be changing, right? It always has to be changing. We got to stay on top of things. And, and praise God that we have men that. Are, are in the police department that have military experience that are able to give us insight. And, and so um, be on the lookout for announcements and things like that. But again, I, I can't stress this enough. Just get down. Okay, on to chapter five. You know, this community who sought the Lord, right, trusted the Lord, it's the same community that in chapter 5 started to self-destruct because of festering grievances. Nehemiah has to turn his attention from constructing the wall and building the wall and leading people 
to build the wall to now taking care of issues. Taking care of the, taking, trying to, to, to appease people so that they're building a physical wall instead of building these mental walls and these walls between each other because of these arguments and these conflicts and these strikes. So in one sense, he's trying to build up walls. In the next sense, he's trying to tear down walls. So let's go back to the scripture that Aiden read. And this is out of Psalm 55, 12 through 14. It is not an enemy who taunts me. I could bear that. It is not my foes who so arrogantly insult me. I could have hidden from them. Instead, it was you, my equal, my companion, my close and close friend. What good fellowship we once enjoyed as we walked together to the house of God. There's a word there that, that, that is sprinkled throughout chapter 5, and that word is against. You see, strife was brewing. Tension was mounting. Well, why wouldn't there? Because, if you, you know, where two or more are gathered, there's going to be conflict. Where two or more are gathered, there's going to be conflict. So in the midst of this great work for a great God... In the first five verses of chapter 5, we hear these complaints that Nehemiah heard. In, in 5.1, it says, Now there was a great outcry of the people and of their wives against their Jewish brothers. This was not just a little disagreement. This wasn't a, a small, minor problem. This wasn't even Sam Blatt and Tobiah. This was their own people. Almost everyone had been working nonstop to build the walls. But in that, there were theirs in their own, their own community that were greedy. And that resulted in widespread poverty and injustice. Taxes were high. There was a drought. There was a famine. And in, these five, in, in, in verses 2 through 5, there are four types of people that Nehemiah describes that were in this situation. And the first type of, the first people, group of people. Uh, these were people who owned no land but needed food. 5-2, for there were those who said, we, our sons and our daughters are many, therefore let us get grain that we may eat and live. The population was growing. Families were growing. But with that, again, with the famine, food was scarce. They were so focused on building the wall that they did not focus on planting their crops, harvesting their crops, taking care of their crops. The second group of people is found in Nehemiah 5.3. These were landowners who had mortgaged their property to buy food. There were others who said, we are mortgaging our fields and our vineyards and our houses that we might get grain because of the famine. Because they were working so hard on this goal, they had to borrow money. They had to mortgage their land to buy grain. The third group complained that the taxes were too high. Like many of us that are getting ready to pay our taxes because it's tax season, this group said, also there were those who said, we have borrowed money for the taxes, for the king's taxes on our fields and our vineyards. And then finally, we had those, that group that was exploiting these people. Now our flesh is like the flesh of our brothers, our children like their children. Yet behold, we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves, and some for, of our daughters are forced into bondage already, and we are help, helpless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. These nobles and officials were charging crazy interest rates. I think back to stories of, of the 80s when you try to get a mortgage, 18, 16, 18% mortgage. You know, we're complaining about 6% right now. But there were days when it was 18%. That's crazy interest. But it was their own people that was, that was doing this. They were taking land and even children as collateral. So when the crops fell because of the famine, they didn't have any way to pay it back. So the, the creditors took away their property, sold their children into slavery. Let's just say they were able to have a good crop, they were so focused on building the wall that the enemies would come in and take all the crops. So either the famine got it, the creditors got it, or the enemy got it. So not only was there a physical warfare war, there was a psychological war going on as well. And these problems had been growing. So my wife and I have conversations. And a lot of times she lets me in on it 
after the fact. Anybody else have that, those conversations where she's had the whole conversation in her head and, and how I'm, she thinks I'm going to respond? And then she comes to me and are, are kind of already upset, right? Because she's, she's had the whole conversation in her head. And then when she lets, allows me to be a part of that conversation, it's like, well, I just found out. Like, I, right now, like, right now just found out. That's kind of how Nehemiah was. All this rumbling and going on and, 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 and complaining, all that had been going on. Nehemiah's thinking, man, we're building these walls. I'm protecting people. I got this guy doing this, this person doing this. I got family with this working on this wall. I got people coming in out of town. They're working here. They're staying here. He's moving. He's working. Then all of a sudden, he's like, you want me to fix? I, I just found out. And so he had to fix it. Now, Nehemiah, he could have easily just thrown his hands in the air and said, I quit. It's broken. I quit. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. Like, I thought we were all moving in the same direction. I quit. But you see, he couldn't quit because it was broken. He could have quit because it was broken, but he couldn't quit because it was broken. You see, one thing is for sure, if at all, if at all possible, conflicts need, must be resolved. Because here's what happens if they're not. Efficiency, productivity drops to zero. Marriages fall apart. Because you're no longer married, you're just cohabitating. Families are left in a state of chaos. Churches split. We see the steps that he took to stop the strife in verses 6 through 13. In verse 6, he says, Then I was very angry when I heard their outcry in these words. It's not that Nehemiah had an anger issue or an anger problem. This was what, what the Bible calls righteous anger. It's the same anger that, that Moses expressed when he threw down and broke the stone tablets of the law in Exodus 32. It's the same anger that Jesus was filled with when he saw the Pharisees' hardened hearts in, in Mark 3. And when he declared, when he cleared out the temple, in Luke 19, Nehemiah was very angry. But it's okay to be angry, but what? Sin not. Verse 7 says that he took the time to consult himself. So in spite of the anger, in spite of all the things that, that's going on, he did not take immediate action. How many times in our lives have we gotten angry and we immediately respond? It's act, then think, right? It's act, then think. But what Nehemiah did is he consulted with himself. Basically, what that means is he took a step back and saw the big picture. He wasn't so focused on this one thing that he was consumed by this one thing. He said, you know what I need to do? I need to step back and gain perspective. I need to look back and see, okay, what's, what's going on here? And so he took that step back. That Hebrew word means to cons uh, of consult means to give one self advice. He was able to see the whole picture. Proverbs 32, uh, 16, 32 challenges us. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who rules his spirit than he who captures a city. So after stepping back, gaining perspective, he said, I need to confront those that are causing this issue. And, and so he publicly confronted the people who created the, the, the strife. And because it was the whole nation, he brought everybody in on it. And he demanded a public rebuke and repentance because it was the nobles and officials' exploitation of their own people that had caused this issue to come. But not only that, it was against God. While they had been praying to God, for the help of rebuilding the wall, they were ignoring the commands. And so Nehemiah's rebuke, there's actually six steps of, of his appeal when he rebuked them. The first one is that he, uh, he appealed to their love. He said, you are exacting usury, uh, uh, each from his brother. He reminded them that you're robbing your own countrymen. You are taking from your own people. 
He uses that word brother four different times in his speech, which goes to Psalm 133, 1. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. So you remind them, this is, this is not a customer. This is not somebody that, that you should be taking advantage of. This is your brother and your sister. The second thing is, the second appeal, he reminded them of God's redemptive purpose. In verse 8, I said to them, we according to our ability have redeemed our Jewish brothers who were sold to the nations. Now, would you even sell your brothers that they may be sold to us? God had just, had, had throughout, throughout, uh, the, this time of, 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 you know, they were in captivity. God, God rescued them from Egypt. God rescued them from, from Babylon. Nehemiah himself even bought his brothers and sisters out of slavery. And now these money lenders, these creditors, were putting them right back into slavery. The next appeal was based on God's word, Nehemiah 5, 9. The thing which you are doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of our God? He called them out. You're not doing right. You are going against God's clear commands. He reminded them of their witness because of the reproach of the nations, our enemies. You see, Israel was supposed to be the light in the darkness, a light to their enemies. But all their business dealings, all that showed was that they were shady. There was no light. When, when, when we're called and when the, the people of, of the Jewish people then were called to make people thirsty for God, these people had lost their saltiness. They were more worried and more focused on selfish gain instead of sharing God with people, being who God has called them to be. He appealed to his own actions. This is the NLT. I myself, as well as my brothers and my workers, have been lending the money, lending the people money and grain. But now let us stop this business of charging interest. You must restore their fields, vineyards, olive groves, and homes to them this very day and repay the interest you charged when you lent them money, grain, new wine, and oil. You see, Nehemiah lent money out, but he didn't charge interest. He didn't say, I'll, I'll let you borrow $100. I'll, I'll lend you $100, but I need 120 back. He said, no, $100 for $100. He had integrity. And that's why he said with boldness, restore their fields. Give them back their olive groves, their homes. This very day. It's not like he said, go home and think about your business plan. Go home and check your bottom line. And then if you can do it, do it. He said, this very day. Finally, he appealed to God, the judgment of God. Verses 12 and 13 say, when they said, we will give it back and we will require nothing from them, we will do exactly as you say. So I called the priest and took an oath from them that they would do according to his promise. Verse 13, I also took, also shook out the front of my garment and said, thus may God shake out every man from this house and from his possessions who does not fulfill this promise. Even thus may he be shaking out and emptied. And all the assembly said, amen. And they praised the Lord. Then the people did according to this promise. They wanted to do what was right. And there's a lot of, a lot of what, what I've read in the New Testament kind of mirrors what happened in the Old Testament. I'm going to use Acts for two examples with this. He said, we want to do what is right. So in Acts, in the early church, they were growing, right? And then there is this guy named Barnabas, Barney. He Came on, he came into some money. And so what he wanted to do was give it to the church. So he gave it to the church. He didn't want anything back. He didn't want, he didn't want you know, a part of the church. He didn't want the sanctuary to be named after him. He said, no, it's yours. No confusion, all yours. So Barney gave all the money to the church. Everybody, yeah, yeah all right, go Barnabas. Well, Ananias and Sapphira heard what happened with Barnabas. He was, they were like, man, he got praised. We're going to give money too. We're going to give some money too. We're going to sell some land and give them all of it. 
but they kept some for themselves. Caused that strife, not only within themselves, but with God, because he said, give it all. Well, they said, we're gonna give it all. God never said, don't give me all of it. They made the choice to give it all. And so, you know, apostles got wind of it and said, okay, uh, did you give it all? Yeah, dead, right? And then here comes the wife. Hey, did y'all get it all? Yeah, dead. You say, then Barnabas didn't have to think about it. He said, I'll give it all to you. And then I said, Sapphira, they plotted. They created a strife. It also leads to another uh, 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 truth is that um, youth always be ready. You want to know why? Because in Acts it says, and the young men picked up the bodies and took it out. So youth always be ready to go to work because you never know when you might be called to, call, to take a body out. So always be ready. And Matt, Pastor Matt, you're the youth pastor, so you're taking the lead, I guess, on that. So be ready. So they said, we'll give it back this very day, and everybody said amen. We'll give back everything and demand nothing from the people. So Nehemiah ended the business meeting with three action steps in verse 13. First, he shook out the folds of his robe. This symbolized that what God would do if they broke their vow. He would shake them off. Next, the congregation responded with the collective amen. Amen. May it be so. Finally, they praised the Lord in unison. You see, what started as a great outcry of, of, of outrage led to a confrontation, led to a commitment to change, and then ultimately concluded with shouts of praise in a corporate worship. Because Nehemiah was willing to confront the conflict. Nehemiah was willing to stop the strife. And then to describing his own lifestyle during this period, Nehemiah tells us how he behaved. He was being very transparent, very transparent with what he did. If you read verses, uh, 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 I think it's like uh, 16, 17, 18, somewhere around there, it talks about, hey, I could have done this. I could have taken the, the, the governor's portion, but I did not. Because here's the problem with not being transparent. So for me, back in my, when, beast, when I was in the secular field, this was my saying. I even had a little thing on my, on my door, on my desk. It said, I trust God. Everyone else bring data. I trust God. Everyone else bring data. Because here's the problem. When you're not transparent, you are allowing, you are actually encouraging other people to create their own narrative. Because when I don't share everything that I know with you, guess what? You are then going to say, well, Pastor Gary don't want to say this. Pastor Gary don't want to. Why aren't they talking about this? Why aren't they doing this? Why aren't they doing that? I come from public education. Everything in public education, is you can FOIA it. Freedom of, Freedom of Information Act. You can correct, suggest, you can request salaries, plus it's posted, salaries from, from anywhere from bus drivers to aides to superintendent. You want to know what it is? There you go. You want to know my salary? I'll tell you. Because only two things are going to happen. You're either going to say, man, you need some more money, or man, we're paying you way too much. I got no problem. Because again, if I don't share everything that I know, I am then allowing you. I am telling you to basically come up with your own narrative. And that can create what? This strife, conflict. So as I know, like I told the elders, as I know, you know. Because I, I don't like to keep secrets. Because what's in the dark will come to light. And so Nehemiah was like, hey, I could have taken the governor's portion. I could have done this. I could have done that. I did not for fear of the Lord. Nehemiah was motivated by two biblical principles during his 12 years. He was devoted to the great commandment, which is found in, in Mark 12, 30, 31. This is what Jesus later would spell out. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
There is no other commandment greater than these. Before thinking about how he could make a profit, he sought the Lord. Verse 15, he describes how previous governors got wealthy. Then he compared himself to what others did. In, in 5.15 in the NLT, he said, because, but because I feared God, I did not act that way. 17 and 18, we see that he did not live extravagant, extravagantly, but instead was very generous with what he had. He provided meals because he loved and revered God. The second pr principle is that he loved the people that God had called him to serve. You see, that's a great example for us to follow. First, by focusing on, our, on God and our relationship with God. Love God, right? Love God. It's on the walls there. And then as we do that, then we will have more love and compassion for others. Love people, reach the world. And here's the thing. It's not only to love others, because I love all of y'all. But, and we can we say we love all of us when we have disagreement? See, I'm called to love you even if me and you have a conflict. Even if me and you have issues, I'm called to love you. Because me not loving you is basically saying, God, I know your love is everlasting. I'm supposed to be Christ-like, but I don't like that guy. Can you work on him? Would you work on him and you fix him, let me know, and then I'll love him again. So here's some things to think about. There is a direct correlation between the effectiveness of our mission and how we treat each other. How are we supposed to be a church or, or, or build a church if we can't be the church? How are we supposed to build the church if we can't be the church? How can, how can I go out and share the gospel if I don't like any of y'all? We must care for one another before we can hope to reach the community and the country and the world for Christ. It starts here. The second thing to think about is relational problems are inevitable. Get over it. There's, and I think I've shared this before. It's called Five, Temptation, Five Temptations of a CEO. And one of the temptations that CEOs have is... They want harmony over conflict. But see, we need to have conflict over harmony. Another way to put it is cross over comfort. Cross over comfort. Are we more focused on comfort? Well, yeah, I don't like him, but, you know, I really don't want to say anything. He knows. They know how I feel about them. And so we're, we're more passive aggressive, right? Right? cross over comfort we should always be seeking the cross and in the cross there's unity and there's going to be conflict I'm, I'm, let, I'm, grow, I'm growing I'm still learning but I really like conflict I'm like a fireman when it comes to conflict if there's smoke I'm running to it I want all of it I, I, I love the, 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 the sparring the going back and forth. It, 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 it kind of, I don't know, it just does something. But that's when I need to take a step back. But we do need to understand that pro relational problems are inevitable. And it is painful. For some people, it is uncomfortable. I'm blurting this way too. I am most comfortable in uncomfortable. I, I, I really like it. <laughs> so pray for me. Because honestly, it's a pride thing. It's a pride thing. But we need to face conflict head on. Because if we don't face those things head on, guess what? It's going to fester. Then I'm not going to like Pastor Juan that much anymore. Right. Me and Pastor Matt are not going to have a great working relationship. Right. Pastor Joe and I will just be two, two people crossing 
walking up and down the hallway. Well, he hurt my feelings. Well, they said this. That's why we need to talk, right? Every marriage counselor, both secular and, and, and Christian, will say, well, you need to talk your problems. You need to speak and, and say what you mean and mean what you say. So many times, and, 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 and in corporate life, in the secular world, they have coaches that will coach people on how to speak your truth. Because conflict stops productivity. It stops efficiency. The same applies in the church. We cannot further God's kingdom if we're so focused on internal strife. It's painful to stop conflict. But the longer you let it go, the longer you let it fester, the long that you allow the enemy to water that, that thing, it grows bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. We must take the initiative to restore relationships whether we want to or not. And here's, don't wait for the other person. Well, I'm not going to say something until they say something. Well, God put it on your heart to say something, so say it. Right, wrong, or indifferent. We have to say something. And this is the thing we need to be tenacious about, is protecting that unity of the body. If you have been hurt, go and talk to that person like Jesus commanded in Matthew 18. Go and confront that person. If they don't want to listen, then take a witness. If they don't want to, that takes, you know, it, 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 it's church discipline. But if somebody has wronged you, not, anger, not, not, not hurt your feelings, but have morally wronged you, then go to that person. Confront that person with the, with, with the right spirit, right? but then make it right. If you've hurt somebody, go and confess what you did according to what Jesus wrote in Matthew 15, or Matthew 5. If you have an offense against somebody, leave your offering at the altar, go and make it right. And then give your offering. How many, honestly, don't raise your hand, but honestly, can you think of times where you haven't followed that? I know I haven't. Because I'm going to get that person back. They, they're not going to say that to me. But see, we need to realize that God's reputation is at stake when we have conflict. God's reputation is at stake. John 17, 23, I and them and you and me and they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. You see, Jesus prayed that lost people would know God's heart of love. And so when we, brothers and sisters in Christ, we are brought together for the unity of the body. We must walk in the fear of the Lord, not only to avoid reproach of unbelievers, but how better to share Jesus than us being unified. Because people will, get, will not get along all the time. But how do we handle that conflict? How do we handle that strife? How can we win people to Jesus if we're always, yeah, come to Believer's Fellowship. Come, sit with me. Oh, but don't go sit with them. Don't, don't go sit with them. How's that showing Christ? You know, here's the thing. I'm sure every church has problems. I know we have problems here at Believer's Fellowship. You want to know how I know? We have problems here at Believer's Fellowship? Because you're here. <laughs> Bottom line, you're here. But we must deal with conflict head on. And we do that by living in fellowship together. I'm not talking about Lyft, but, shameless plug, Lyft is a great way to build unity. <laughs> Lyft is our small group. Lyft is, is, our, is our morning Bible study, our evening Bible study. But it's called living in fellowship together so that we build that koinonia. We build that fellowship. So when there is strife, when there is conflict, you have people that will pray with you, but you have people that will walk with you. You know, a lot has changed from the days of Nehemiah to today. So many things have, have isolated us. We have so many people that are just in their own silo. 
You know, there are people that'll leave here today and the next time they see any of y'all will be next Sunday because there's no koinonia. There's no fellowship. But see, when you do that, you're taking yourself out of the fellowship. When you do that, you, you, take, you, you, you take away the weapons that God, the ammunition that God has given us to be a family, to be a fellowship, to be brothers and sisters for the Lord. Living in fellowship together is necessary for us personally, for our growth, and then for us to minister effectively to, other, to the others in the name of Jesus. There's this article that I saw and I read. It's called, How to Turn a Disagreement into a Feud. How to Turn a Disagreement into a Feud. Let me know by your chuckles how many of you have done this. Avoid conflict so that your feelings build up and then you explode. Be vague and general when you share your concerns so that the other person cannot do anything practical to change the situation. Assume you know all the facts and that you are totally right. Right? How about this one? Avoid possible solutions and go for total victory and unconditional surrender. <laughs> Just go for the jugular every time. See, we don't need to do that. Those are the things we, we need to be transparent. We need to be very open. Because then how do people know what they're apologizing for? If I've wronged you, you say, I, I don't know how I've wronged you. I don't know how you've wronged me. I'm sorry. Be specific. Because sometimes we hold on to things that are not morally wrong. Just, I'm butt hurt. Just be honest with you, right? And so, what morally, what, what have you, how have you been wronged morally? And so, this leads me into some practical steps to stop strife. Make sure it's a moral issue. Nehemiah was very angry because of the injustice. People were morally wronged. So his anger was justified. But in all cases, we are to what? Extend grace. Extend grace. All the time. Because grace was extended to us. So who am I to hold grace ransom for you, to you? Steve, I don't like the way you looked at me just now. So should I be mad? No. Extend grace. The second thing, the second step is think before speaking. It hurt me putting it up. <laughs> think before speaking. So I'm going to tell on myself again. I, I do a lot of that. This is, I, I need somebody just to build a box up here because confession time here. There has been a time or two where I've gone up to somebody and just laid into them, and then a couple days later they say, you know, Brother Gary, maybe you shouldn't have done it that way. I was like, you know what, you're absolutely right. But I felt better in the moment, so I've needed to apologize because I spoke, then thought. So many times we need to think, then speak. Third thing is meet with them face to face. This can be very uncomfortable for a lot of people. Very uncomfortable for a lot of people. Listen to this quote. Confrontation is caring enough about the other person to get the conflict on the table and to talk about it. If I didn't care about you, I wouldn't tell you. It's because I do care about you that I want us to be right. I want this to be right, and I want this to be right. But in order for this to be right, this needs to be right. There has to be unity here. Nehemiah went straight to the source in verse 8 and confronted the people that, he had, wrong, that had wronged them. We don't need to go around telling people what people have done to us. Uh, Mr. Mike, you just don't understand. Brother Jimmy's been talking crazy about me. I, what's, what's he going to do? First of all, he doesn't need to carry my burden. He doesn't, carry my, he doesn't need to carry my offense. I need to go to Brother Jimmy. 
Jimmy, I didn't, after I think, take that step back, right? But I need to go, hey, I didn't, you know, it hurt my feelings. I didn't appreciate da, 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 da. But so many times we just go around. We, we talk about them, but not to them. We need to talk to the person, not about the person. And then if we're on the receiving end, our, when they say, yeah, G Pastor Gary, this person did da, 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 da. My first response, my response should be, well, have you told them? If not, I'll go with you. But you need to tell them. Don't expect me to tell them. You tell them. Because you were brave enough to tell me. We can go together, but you're the one that needs to tell them. Because it's your offense, not my offense. Because here's the thing, you either got to go home with your spouse or you got to face your, 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 your brother or sister again. And what if I'm not there? We need to seek resolution. We need to seek resolution. Our goal in stopping strife or confronting conflict should always be to, for resolution and restoration in a relationship. Our goal is not to prove ourselves right and the other person wrong. Our goal is not to tear people down, but to build the, the body up. So how can we get to work on kingdom work if we're so focused on building the walls in our relationships? How can we be kingdom-minded all, if all that I am is self-minded, of self-preservation? You see, when there's unresolved conflict in the church, it only impacts our relationships with each other. It harms our testimony to our community outside this church. So before we can ever hope to reach our world for Jesus, we have to care for each other. And that's what Jesus was talking about when he, when he said this in John 13, 34 and 35, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another even as, I, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. This gets me to the second point of Acts. You know, that church was moving. Right after Pentecost, that early church after Pentecost, there were thousands and thousands of, of were coming to Christ. And the, 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 the apostles were, were moving. They were teaching, preaching. Then there was that conflict. Everybody remember that conflict, what was going on? It was the Hellenistic Jews and, and, and the Hebrew Jews, the widows. Or the Hellenistic widows and, and, the, and, and the Hebrew widows. The Hellenistic widows were thinking they weren't being treated equal to the, to the Jewish widows. And so what happened? They started this strife, this conflict. And then one tell the apostles, they're like, listen, we're, 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 we're sharing Jesus. We're, we're bringing people to Christ. We're, we're witnessing. We're preaching. We're teaching. And so what did they do? They called seven men. They said, oh, pick seven men amongst you to, to handle this, to take care of it. That's where we get deacons from, right? So again, what started as confrontation, what started as, 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 as something to, that could potentially fester and break that early church, they took a step back. They found a resolution, and they were able to move forward. And then verse 7 of Acts 6 says, The word of God kept on spreading, and the number of the disciples uh, continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. You see, the problems that both Nehemiah and the apostles dealt with had been ongoing for some time. That's why, here's another, we have elders, okay, Mike Miller's an elder, Jimmy Cabrera's an elder, Bill Robertson's an elder, Pastor Joe's an elder, Pastor Juan's an elder, I'm an elder. If there's an issue in this body, you have a relationship, hopefully, with one of us. Let us know. How can we fix or how can we pray if we don't know? Because we're moving along like we're, everything's going okay. And then all of a sudden, comes up, comes, something comes up from the left field. It's like, I, what? Well, I've been saying it for months. Well, who you been saying it to? Right? Because you have your little parking lot meetings. The unofficial meeting after the official meeting. Bring it to one of us so that we can handle it. Because here's probably what's going to happen. This is the answer you're going to get. I might not know right now, but let's go find out. Or can you give me a couple of days? I'll find out for you. 
Or you know what, let's set up a medium and, and talk to the, the person that's offended you. What does keeping it to yourself do other than make you mad and then leave the church? And so Nehemiah led the people to repent and reconcile so that the people could get back to the work that God had called them and commissioned them to do, to live together in fellowship in a way that glorified God. So are you today committed to handle conflict like Nehemiah did? In your life, are you committed to handle conflict the way Nehemiah did in Nehemiah 5? When there is some kind of conflict, will you address it quickly and directly? Don't let it fester. I've been on both sides where I've let it fester. Right? Just let it stew. And it just grows and grows and grows. I found out when you take care of it sooner rather than later, it typically comes out better. And then will you be a part of the solution, not part of the problem? And when it is needed and required, will you repent so that there can be reconciliation? And then ultimately, will you demonstrate your fear of the Lord by keeping your focus on what's best for the kingdom and his glory? I'm gonna ask the band to come up at this time. You know, before we could talk about conflict within the body, conflict within the church, conflict with your brothers and sisters, with your wife, with your kids, with your husband, before we could talk about any of that, Is there conflict between you and God? Is there conflict between you and God? Because if you don't know Christ right now, today, you're an enemy of God. So you have conflict. There is conflict because you are an enemy of God. So right where you are right now, do you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? Have you ever accepted him as your Lord and Savior, asked him to forgive you of all your sins? Because if you don't do that, there is always going to be conflict. You can't run from it. It's going to fester. It's going to, to bleed into all areas of your life, your marriage, your kids, your job, your finances, your health. Everything will be impacted because of your conflict with God. If you know Jesus Christ today as your Lord and Savior, but maybe you've walked away. Maybe you feel that God has wronged you because he took something, he took something that was yours. Or you're going through the valley. And you keep on asking, God, when are you going to get me out of here? Well, what are we doing for that? The psalmist wrote, as, yea, as I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It never said, yea, as I camp. Yea, as I build a house. So are you blaming God for something that he's done in your life instead of singing his praises for, that, for glorifying them? Because it's through those things, it's through that fire that we are refined. It's through that fire, through that struggle that we are made closer to God. I don't often see it in the moment, but I praise God for the fire. I praise God for the struggles because my allegiance, my, 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 my need for him grows. I see that I can't do this thing called life without him. Be it medical, with our health, with our jobs, with our marriage, with our kids. None of that can we, can we do that on our own. We don't have the strength to do it on our own. And so are you blaming God for something right now that you just need to ask for forgiveness and praise him for it? Because you are being refined. I love that song. It reminded me he's been that fourth person in that fire for so many times in my life. 
He was always been faithful, even when I wasn't, even when I was walking against him. He's always been faithful. Maybe there's a conflict in your marriage. You know, the enemy loves to entangle himself in our marriage. He loves to build that wedge between husband and wife. That's why we need to pray for each other. Pray together and pray by ourselves and lift our spouses up. Because when, that, when you're not right with your spouse, the, it's almost like the world is not right, amen? Have you ever had an argument with your spouse and then nothing goes right? You're always just off? I'll tell you right now, Sophia is my metronome. She is the thing that balances me. I might bless God for her sometimes, but I know that she's my foundation. God first, right? Amen. Here's the thing. In Belize, they're never done building, and they always have the, the rebarb up. And so they got a, a, they should have built the foundation deeper. Because the taller you want your structure, the deeper your foundation has to be. So is your foundation in God? Is your foundation in Christ? Because if it's not, then you can build wherever you want. It's not, there's, it's not, there's no structure, no, no stability to it. So where's your marriage? Is it built on the foundation of God or on the foundation of self? Is there strife or conflict that you haven't forgiven your spouse for? Youth, is there conflict or strife amongst you or your, your parents? I get it, we've all been kids. And I know this world attacks you, I get that. I will never know what you go through today because the world has, the devil has improved the means in which he attacks. But know that you got a church that is praying for you. And so there's conflict between you and your mom, you and your dad, you and your friends. Don't hold on to that. That's what the enemy wants. He wants you to hold on to it because he wants you to be separate from your family. He wants you to be separate from your friends that are inviting you to church. He wants you to be separated from the community of believers that love you that will pour into you, that wants you to be successful as a Christian and as a man and a woman of God. And so there's something that you're harboring. Let, forgive your parents because God has forgiven you and then tell them, make that right. I'd ask you to stand at this time. I'm gonna ask Pastor Matt to come. The band's gonna play. And, and really, the invitation is simple. If you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, now's the time. God has put you here right now for such a time as this so that you'll no longer be in conflict with God, so that you'll never, you will no longer be the enemy that God sees right now. He loves you, but God's a just God too. And so accept him as your Lord and Savior. Ask him to forgive you of your sins. Accept him and, and bring him into your heart. Live the way God has called. We are created to worship him. We are created to glorify him. Second, if there's an issue in your life where you haven't forgiven somebody, if that person's here right now, go to that person and forgive them. You can talk about it later, but make it right now. Again, leave your offering at the altar. If you, have, if you haven't forgiven somebody, if you've kept that grace from them, Extend that grace now. There's something going on in your marriage. There's something going on with your house, your family. There's something going on at work. Just give it to God. Let's pray. Father God, we just come to you right now, Father. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy, Father, that is ever extending. Father, we thank you for your providence. Father God, right now, I pray that, Father, you speak to us, Father, that you search our hearts, Father. You search the depths of our hearts, Father. If there's anything that we need to bring up, Father, either forgiveness or forgiving, Father, that you just bring it to light, Father. Father, I pray for our families, Father. I pray for our marriages. I pray for our children. I pray for our youth, Father. I pray for this body. 
Father, I pray that you give us the conviction and the courage, Father, when things are not right, when there is conflict, Father, you give us the courage to do what you've called us to do, to confront it head on, Father, in a godly way, but we confront it so that we can heal and be unified, Father. Just thank you for all that you do. It's in Jesus' name, amen.
You may be seated. Amen. Amen. You know, one thing that came to my mind uh, when I was out here is, you know, we talked about forgiving others, our, our moms, our dads, our spouses. Forgive yourself. So many times we hold on to things because we're unwilling to forgive ourselves. And so forgive yourself too. What happened in the past is in the past. Don't hold on to it. Amen? Amen. Uh, just real quick, uh, some medical update on me. Uh, I got, had my uh, appointment last week, got the results back. Um, I'm not going to get into details, but uh, I got to do another procedure in, 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 in August, uh, and then probably yearly I'll have to have colonoscopies. Uh, it's an aggressive type of, of, of polyp or whatever, and, and so just be praying for that. Praise God he got it all, he thinks, but uh, Amen. But uh, prayers work. Thank you so much for your prayers. Definitely felt then and now. And so uh, press on. Pastor Matt. We have a video to announce the men's conference. Hello, dear family at Believers Fellowship. I'm so excited to be with our men on March 1st and 2nd for the Man Enough Retreat Weekend, and I'm praying that God would speak a great, mighty word to each one of us. He's been preparing my heart out of the book of 1 Samuel, and I have three messages I'm going to present to you. Number one, are you man enough to hear and respond? Number two, are you man enough to worship and lead? And number three, are you man enough to submit and obey? I'm praying that God will speak a word to each one of us do a fresh work in our hearts and lives. I'm praying for souls to be saved and saints to be encouraged. If you haven't signed up, please sign up now. I look forward to seeing you March 1st and 2nd. God bless. Amen. That is uh, Brother Denny Autry, and he, man, he's amazing. You don't want to miss it, guys. Start signing up for that. You can get more information in the lobby. You don't want to miss it. It's going to be an incredible time, and he got the dates right, March 1st and 2nd. So tonight we do have children's services. We do have a wanna. We do have our lift at 5:30. We do not have youth at 5:15 just because youth is ongoing right now and they, they're still in D now until early this afternoon. So we do have those evening services. We also have our Wednesday night Bible studies. Men, we have Bible studies still going on. Women, we have Bible study, and as well as our children and youth services. If you guys are missing those Wednesday nights, man, you really want to be here. You don't want to miss it. Tomorrow, the office will be closed, so if you try to get a hold of us tomorrow, well, I'm not going to be here. We will not be here, but you can still call, and you can still get through to one of us, so if you need to get a hold of us, give us a call, and if you need a cell phone number, I'll give you Pastor Gary's. We have, we have Miss Stephanie who's going to make an announcement. Good morning. Just wanted to make an announcement, letting you guys know that this is time of the year that the Hope Ministry is starting back up, our Pray and Go Ministry. Uh, for those that have participated in this, know that this is a great opportunity for us to go out in the community, our local community, and afar to uh, choose different communities and actually cover them in prayer and, and just really fellowship with each other and walk with each other. Um, for those who aren't comfortable praying and want to teach their children to pray, this is also a great opportunity for you to do that as well. Because there, not only are you walking community and actually fellowshipping with people you normally don't speak with, but your children are actually talking to children they normally don't speak with, and they're actually learning by example. And so, um, so join us this coming Saturday. Uh, it'll start at 11. Um, if you would like to join, just meet me in the lobby back there. But um, this is a great opportunity for us to actually spread the word to communities and different people that probably this is the only time they'll see Jesus. This is the only time they'll feel Jesus. And after we pray, what we do is we put a door hanger 
with the with the church's um, information and contact information, and it's not to be boastful and let them know, hey, believers, believers fellowship prayed for you, but it is, um, hopefully, the prayer is an open door for them to start a relationship, and hopefully come to the church. So um, again, just join us um, on the twenty fourth at eleven a.m. Um, I promise I have snacks just in case you want snacks <laughs> and we'll walk around and pray for um, our community right here we'll start with this small one right here rose landing right across the street okay thank you you had me at snacks <laughs> so youth you got that extends to you guys as well if you'd like to be here it's it's an awesome time hey guests if we do have guests here like i said at the beginning we have a gift that we would like to put in your hands at the end of service so if you'd grab that welcome card at the seat fill that out meet pastor gary in the lobby right after service he has a gift that he would like to give you and as well as our online guests remember to go to bfchurch.com fill that out so we can reach out to you we can be praying for you if you have any prayer needs don't forget your tithes and offerings guys we do have several ways to give you can give online at bfchurch.com click on the give tab you can mail those in you can put them in the offering receptacles on your way out and with that you are dismissed